Surely you've all heard of the Apostles' Creed, that famous symbol or declaration of faith whose origins stretch back into the mists of late antiquity, and which is still used today in various branches of Western Christianity. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and so on. It consists of a series of affirmations of allegiance to the central doctrines of the Church, things such as the Holy Trinity, the virgin birth of Jesus, his death and resurrection, his impending return as judge over all mankind, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the belief in eternal life. These articles of faith, shared by Catholics and Protestants alike, give a concise reckoning of the foundations of their beliefs, and are regularly repeated as a reminder of the Church's central mysteries. Well, in the early decades of the 19th century, there was one man who felt compelled to create a creed of his own. Not to the Church and its doctrines, but to the traditions which he felt driven to revive by some romantic stroke of scholarly enthusiasm, namely, the doctrines of Platonic philosophy that he had inherited from the writings of the ancients. The Englishman Thomas Taylor was a vocal critic of the Christianity of his day, particularly the Church of England, believing it to be founded upon a theologically and philosophically thin gruel when compared to the sublime insights of his master Plato, the greatest expounder of the ancient theology shared by such figures as Orpheus, Pythagoras, Aristotle, Numenius, Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, and so on. The following, then, is Taylor's attempt, in no few words, at putting together a series of affirmations, of I-believe statements, which concisely laid out his vision of the cosmos, physical and intellectual. Before moving on, however, I need to mention that this video is part of a collaboration project on Platonic philosophy with a handful of other creators. When you're done here, please go check out the work of my fellow demiurges, Dr. Justin Sledge from Esoterica with a presentation on Plotinus versus the Gnostics, Zevi Slavin from Seekers of Unity examining the links between Platonism and Kabbalah, Philip Holm from Let's Talk Religion, presenting on What is Neoplatonism and Neoplatonism in Islamic Thought, Dr. Angela Puka from Angela's Symposium, exploring Neoplatonism and Renaissance magic, and Dr. John Virveki, presenting on Neoplatonism and 4E Cognition. We hope that this collaboration will give newcomers a broad overview of this tradition, which has endured now for well over two millennia. Now without further ado, I present to you the work of Thomas Taylor. The Platonic Philosopher's Creed 1. I believe in one first cause of all things, whose nature is so immensely transcendent that it is even super-essential, and that in consequence of this it cannot properly either be named, or spoken of, or conceived by opinion, or be known, or perceived, by any being. 2. I believe, however, that if it be lawful to give a name to that which is truly ineffable, the appellations of the one and the good are of all others the most adapted to it the former of these names indicating that it is the principle of all things, and the latter that it is the ultimate object of desire to all things. 3. I believe that this immense principle produces such things as are first and proximate to itself, most similar to itself. 
just as heat immediately proceeding from fire is most similar to the heat in the fire, and the light immediately emanating from the sun, to that which the sun essentially contains. Hence this principle produces many principles proximately from itself. 4. I likewise believe that since all things differ from each other and are multiplied with their proper differences, each of these multitudes is suspended from its one proper principle, that in consequence of all this, all beautiful things, whether in souls or in bodies, are suspended from one fountain of beauty. I believe that whatever possesses symmetry and whatever is true, and all principles, are in a certain respect conate with the first principle, so far as they are principles, with an appropriate subjection and analogy. That all other principles are comprehended in this first principle, not with interval and multitude, but as parts in the whole, and number in the monad. I believe that it is not a certain principle like each of the rest, for of these, one is the principle of beauty, another of truth, and another of something else, but it is simply principle. Nor is it simply the principle of beings, but it is the principle of principles. It being necessary that the characteristic property of principle, after the same manner as other things, should not begin from multitude, but should be collected into one monad as a summit, and which is the principle of principles. 5. I believe, therefore, that such things as are produced by the first good in consequence of being conascent with it do not recede from essential goodness, since they are immovable and unchanged, and are eternally established in the same blessedness. All other natures, however, being produced by the one good and many goodnesses, since they fall off from essential goodness, and are not immovably established in the nature of divine goodness, possess on this account the good according to participation. 6. I believe that as all things considered as subsisting causally in this immense principle are transcendently more excellent than they are when considered as effects proceeding from him, this principle is very properly said to be all things, prior to all. Priority denoting exempt transcendency. Just as number may be considered as subsisting occultly in the monad, and the circle in the center, this occult being the same in each, with causal subsistence. 7. I believe that the most proper mode of venerating this great principle of principles is to extend in silence the ineffable parturitions of the soul to its ineffable co-sensation, and that if it be at all lawful to celebrate it, it is to be celebrated as a thrice unknown darkness, as the God of all gods, and the unity of all unities, as more ineffable than all silence, and more occult than all essence, as holy among the holies, and concealed in its first progeny, the intelligible gods. 8. I believe that self-subsistent natures are the immediate offspring of this principle, if it be lawful thus to denominate things which ought rather to be called ineffable unfoldings into light from the ineffable.
9. I believe that incorporeal forms or ideas resident in a divine intellect are the paradigms or models of everything which has perpetual subsistence according to nature. That these ideas subsist primarily in the highest intellects, secondarily in souls, and ultimately in sensible natures, and that they subsist in each, characterized by the essential properties of the beings in which they are contained. That they possess a paternal, producing, guardian, connecting, perfective, and uniting power. That in divine beings they possess a power fabricative and gnostic, in nature, a power fabricative, but not Gnostic, and in human souls, in their present condition through a degradation of intellect, a power Gnostic, but not fabricative. 10. I believe that this world, depending on its divine artificer, who is himself an intelligible world, replete with the archetypal ideas of all things, is perpetually flowing and perpetually advancing to being, and compared with its paradigm, has no stability or reality of being. That considered, however, as animated by a divine soul, and as being the receptacle of divinities from whom bodies are suspended, it is justly called by Plato, a blessed God. 11. I believe that the great body of this world, which subsists in a perpetual dispersion of temporal extension, may be properly called a whole with a total subsistence, or a whole of wholes, on account of the perpetuity of its duration though this is nothing more than a flowing eternity. I believe that the other holes which it contains are the celestial spheres, the sphere of ether, the whole of air considered as one great orb, the whole earth and the whole sea, that these spheres are parts with a total subsistence, and through this subsistence are perpetual. 12. I believe that all parts of the universe are unable to participate of the providence of divinity in a similar manner, but some of its parts enjoy this eternally, and others temporally. Some in a primary, others in a secondary degree. For the universe being a perfect whole must have a first, a middle, and a last part but its first parts, as having the most excellent subsistence, must always exist according to nature, and its last parts must sometimes exist according to, and sometimes contrary to, nature. Hence the celestial bodies, which are the first parts of the universe, perpetually subsist according to nature, both the whole spheres and the multitude coordinate to these wholes and the only alteration which they experience is a mutation of figure and variation of light at different periods. But in the sublunary region, while the spheres of the elements remain on account of their subsistence as wholes, always according to nature, the parts of the wholes have sometimes a natural and sometimes an unnatural subsistence, for thus alone can the circle of generation unfold all the variety which it contains. I believe, therefore, that the different periods in which these mutations happen are with great propriety called by Plato periods of fertility and sterility. For in these periods a fertility or sterility of men, animals, and plants takes place so that in fertile periods 
mankind will be both more numerous and upon the whole superior in mental and bodily endowments to the men of a barren period and that a similar reasoning must be extended to irrational animals and plants. I also believe that the most dreadful consequence attending a barren period with respect to mankind is this, that in such a period they have no scientific theology, and deny the existence of the immediate progeny of the ineffable cause of all things. 13. I believe that as the world considered as one great comprehending whole is a divine animal, so likewise every whole which it contains is a world, possessing in the first place a self-perfect unity proceeding from the ineffable by which it becomes a god. In the second place, a divine intellect. In the third place, a divine soul, and in the last place, a deified body. I believe that each of these wholes is the producing cause of all the multitude which it contains, and on this account is said to be a whole prior to parts, because considered as possessing an eternal form which holds all its parts together and gives to the whole perpetuity of subsistence, it is not indigent of such parts to the perfection of its being, and that it follows by a geometrical necessity that these holes which rank thus high in the universe must be animated. 14. Hence I believe that after the immense principle of principles in which all things casually subsist, absorbed in super-essential light, and involved in unfathomable depths, a beautiful series of principles proceeds, all largely partaking of the ineffable, all stamped with the occult characters of deity, all possessing an overflowing fullness of good. That from these dazzling summits, these ineffable blossoms, these divine propagations, being life, intellect, soul, nature, and body, depend. Monads suspended from unities, deified natures proceeding from deities. I believe that each of these monads is the leader of a series which extends to the last of things and which, while it proceeds from, at the same time abides in, and returns to its leader. Thus all beings proceed from, and are comprehended in, the first being. All intellects emanate from one first intellect, all souls from one first soul, all natures blossom from one first nature, and all bodies proceed from the vital and luminous body of the world. I believe that all these great monads are comprehended in the first one, from which both they and all their depending series are unfolded into light, and that hence this first one is truly the unity of unities, the monad of monads, the principle of principles, the God of gods, one and all things, and yet one prior to all. Fifteen. I also believe that man is a microcosm, comprehending in himself partially everything which the world contains divinely and totally that hence he is endued with an intellect subsisting in energy, and a rational soul proceeding from the same causes as those from which the intellect and soul of the universe proceed, and that he has likewise an ethereal vehicle analogous to the heavens, and a terrestrial body composed from the four elements, 
and with which also it is coordinate. 16. I believe that the rational part of man, in which his essence consists, is of a self-motive nature, and that it subsists between intellect, which is immovable both in essence and energy, and nature, which both moves and is moved. 17. I believe that the human as well as every mundane soul uses periods and restitutions of its proper life. For in consequence of being measured by time, it energizes transitively and possesses a proper motion. But everything which is moved perpetually and participates of time revolves periodically and proceeds from the same to the same. 18. I also believe that as the human soul ranks among the number of those souls that sometimes follow the mundane divinities in consequence of subsisting immediately after daimons and heroes, the perpetual attendance of the gods, it possesses a power of descending infinitely into the sublunary region and of ascending from thence to real being. That in consequence of this, the soul, while an inhabitant of earth, is in a fallen condition, an apostate from deity, an exile from the orb of light. That she can only be restored while on earth to the divine likeness, and be able after death to reascend to the intelligible world by the exercise of the cathartic and theoretic virtues the former purifying her from the defilements of a mortal nature, and the latter elevating her to the vision of true being, and that such a soul returns after death to her kindred star from which she fell and enjoys a blessed life. 19. I believe that the human soul essentially contains all knowledge and that whatever knowledge she acquires in the present life is nothing more than a recovery of what she once possessed and which discipline evocates from its dormant retreats. 20. I also believe that the soul is punished in a future for the crimes she has committed in the present life, but that this punishment is proportioned to the crimes, and is not perpetual. Divinity punishing, not from anger or revenge, but in order to purify the guilty soul and restore her to the proper perfection of her nature. 21. I also believe that the human soul on its departure from the present life will if not properly purified, pass into other terrene bodies, and that if it passes into a human body, it becomes the soul of that body. But if into the body of a brute, it does not become the soul of the brute, but is externally connected with the brutal soul in the same manner as presiding daimons are connected in their beneficent operations with mankind. For the rational part never becomes the soul of the irrational nature. 22. Lastly, I believe that souls that live according to virtue shall in other respects be happy, and when separated from the irrational nature and purified from all body, shall be conjoined with the gods and govern the whole world together with the deities by whom it was produced. End of The Platonic Philosopher's Creed by Thomas Taylor Read by Dan Attrell If you would like to support more work such as this, please visit patreon.com slash 
the modern hermeticist. And above all, thank you for listening.